Um, hi everyone. So yeah, welcome to uh today's workshop. Uh, so I'm the instructor, uh, Gary Chen, I'm professor of biostats and also health system and uh, population health. So we're going to talk about uh, treatment on compliance, uh, mediation analysis. Um, so this is actually the second short course that I taught at Birch. So it would be uh, like a continuation of the last one uh, on similar topics. So if you missed the last one, uh, I think it's also recorded and uh, is available online. So uh, some brief organization. Uh, for the first hour, I'm going to talk about treatment non-compliance and then we'll take a 15 minutes break. And then uh, we will spend another hour on um, mediation analysis and uh, intermediate variables. Uh, and um, we'll spend the last 15 minutes for discussions. Uh, the discussion can be on cost materials, or you can bring your own projects uh, uh, to sort of um, discuss if you have you know, related you know, prob uh, uh, you know, um, problems related to what uh, we have uh, discussed. Okay. And also, uh, feel free to use the raise hand button. Uh, or um, type your questions on the chat and how uh, occasionally I monitor that. Okay, so a uh, so brief intro, uh, we all know or heard many times that association does not imply causation. Um, well, but sometimes uh, it's, um, well, we still actually want to study association and we want to do as much as possible to actually make a uh, valid inference from association studies. So when uh, can we, or uh, under what conditions we can sort of make stronger statements? Um, and uh, what's the problem? The problem is usually confounding, that's we all know. Uh, and basically a large short cause, um, we, went through uh, multiple ways of confounding controls. Uh, so the last short call is, more, uh, is uh, basically all on confounding. But confounding is not the only issue you raise, uh, you, you, you sort of face when you sort of analyze complex uh, real world data, uh, particularly like observational studies. So life is often more complicated when we have intermediate variables, that's we actually discuss two instances um, of of those complications in this course. But I just want to uh, recap some of the big picture ideas that we discussed last time uh, on confounding. So uh, suppose we have exposure we denote here as Z. Uh, exposure, intervention, or treatment of interest. Uh, I think in this course, I would um, mostly use like a binary exposure, yes, no, but whether you are assigned to uh, like a, a certain intervention or not, whether you're exposed to a risk factor or not. And you have an outcome of interest. You want to see whether the exposure causes the outcome. Right, but you have confounders, which are variables that associate with both the exposure and the outcome. Uh, if there are variables that relates to both the exposure and the outcome, then you have to, um, in some way, uh, account for the, those variables because don't do that and just look at the outcome, comparing the outcomes um, you know, between the exposed and unexposed group, you are going to get uh, incorrect conclusions. Okay. So, uh, so I also mentioned like the confounders has to be related to both the exposures and the outcome. Right. So if it only relates to one of them, then it's actually not causing the problem. So how to remove or uh, sort of confounding? There are actually two ways. One is uh, two main approach. Uh, 
one is basically you uh, use some analytical techniques to sort of uh, deal with confounding in analysis, or you can do a design if you are able to design your um, you know, study, then you actually can reduce or remove conf uh, confounding from the design phase. So, uh, so uh, we spent a lot of time talking about both last time. Uh, the design is basically you, you can randomize the um, exposure, right? So if you can randomize the exposure, you actually directly break the um, link between any baseline variable with the exposure so that um, the baseline variables are no longer confounders. Okay, so this is, well, I mean, this is an ideal situation, but if you don't have that, you are presented uh, observational data, you want to do secondary data analysis, for example, then you can, you can do some modeling in, uh, to to account for just for confounding. So the first one, which is, uh, well, I guess the two kind of types of methods are both becoming very popular now. The first one is this regression adjustment. You add the confounders into your model uh, or your outcome model, basically, you are sort of, um, explicitly modeling the two blue arrows, you know, Y given X and Z, but then you are not really uh, modeling the relationship between um, the confounder and the exposure. Well, this is one way to do adjustment, but then the other adjustments focus on other um, pathways is propensity score covariate balancing te techniques. That's you actually look at the relationship between the confounders and exposure without uh, needing to, um, you know, directly model the um, relationship between confounder and outcome. So those are sort of the um, main um, sort of ideas, the high level. Uh, so I sort of omit a lot of details, but this is how we deal with confounding. And um, why does randomization remove confounding. But first of all, we want to define what uh, our interest is. Uh, and last time we also introduced the potential outcomes or counterfactual outcomes. Uh, we call this uh, Y1, Y0. Basically they are notations denoting like a hypothetical outcomes. Uh, Y1 would be the um, um, the outcome if the individual is assigned to treatment, Y0 is the outcome, um, the individual if assigned to control. So um, if we define both uh, for like a group of individual then we can talk about like um, taking the mean difference, right? So that this mean difference, the average treatment effect is defined on a group of individuals, on the group of same individuals. But if you just estimate from the data, you just use the exposed group and the compare it with the unexposed group, then you are actually looking at the mean from two subgroups. And the two subgroups may not, well, first of all, the two subgroups are different people. So they may not be, you may not be comparing the same group of people, but, if you do randomization, then under randomization, we actually have independence between your assignment and the potential outcomes. And you can actually show that the mean difference that you just um, compare the two different groups, um, they actually are estimating this thing of interest that is defined for the whole population. So I think this is sort of the uh, main so theoretical reasons, um, methodological reasons, why um, you know uh, randomization works. Um, but for some of you who might be a little bit um, unfamiliar with the potential outcomes notations, we really need those for um, defining the well. I guess the the, the independence, you know, between the. Um, um, you know, randomization with the potential outcome because randomization is actually is 
um, correlated with self self outcome, but uncorrelated with the potential. We have to, um, you know, introduce counterfactual outcome when we want to talk about things more, um, yes, more accurately. For example, what is the meaning of, you know, randomization? What is the meaning of node confounding and so on? So this is, um, you know. Well, this is the ideal case. You have uh, randomization removes confounding, but the rest of this hour I'm going to talk about cases where you have randomized trial with non-compliance. Yes, this is actually one of the biggest limitation of uh, randomized trial. So, um, well, a lot of times you can randomize to a treatment assignment, but people may or may not follow the randomization. And this creates problem because, um, well, well, as you're going to see, like you actually introduce uh, the, the, this confounding, then, I mean, you remove confounding by treatment assignment, but you don't remove the confounding between the treatment received. So taking treatment, um, whoever takes the treatments actually depends on personal characteristics that also affects the outcome. So so, so you reintroduce confounding in a, in a way if you have non-compliance. So the actual treatment received can be different but, um, because of different reasons. And, um, and I actually for a lot of uh, behavioral intervention, we have, um, you know, moderate to serious issues uh, in uh, non-compliance. For example, if uh, the treatment uh, is to encourage, is encouragement to take psychotherapy, um, then um, you know you you are you are going to assignment or well even if you are assigned, uh, you know you might sort of not be really taking you know the treatment but a, a lot of the um, interventions actually is on encouragement right? and then you can see that uh, um, actually a lot of uh, behavioral interventions have substantial can have substantial non-compliance that's why uh, it's uh, of interest to uh, the Bush uh, audience here um, we have a little bit of notations. Uh, we now use T to denote the uh, treatment assignments, uh, Z to denote the treatment received or taken. They can be different because of um, compliance. Well, the first analysis that you could do, and you also probably uh, know it by reading the literature is to do intention to treat analysis. Right. So you can just compare individ uh, outcomes by individual assigned to treatment versus uh, individuals assigned to control, regardless of what treatment is actually received. Now, um, this is a valid um, analysis because uh, treatment is randomly assigned. So the assignment removed confounding between um, treatment assignment and the outcome, right? But it's it's valid for estimating the causal effect of treatment assignment, but not actually taking the treatment. So, uh, sort of you some more familiar with with sort of the um, uh, I, I guess the concepts like effectiveness versus efficacy. So in I guess in a sort of Broad terms, we can say the intention to treat actually uh, measure the effectiveness of the um, of the treatment uh, of, of the intervention, right? But then uh, it it doesn't really uh, uh, estimate the efficacy. And then if you have the um, you know non-compliance, then they are actually different things. Uh, Okay, so we are actually going to, well, we're going to see that compared to ad, uh, average treatment effect without non-compliance, intention to treat analysis is a tiny reason to us now. So you are going to have diluted effects because you are mixing people who actually, you know, may, well, take the other, you know, treatment. So, so you are actually, um, you know, 
and that so the the effectiveness or the culture effect on tumor assignments actually sort of um you know it is it's a diluted version of uh what would happen if there is full compliance. Right. So, um and if you do intention to treat analysis, you actually deliberately not using information on the actual treatment received in the analysis. Um, so, uh, which may or may not be a problem. Okay? So, um, so I guess the question that we want to so explore is that can we use actual in the analysis and that's provide estimate of efficacy in addition to um, um, effectiveness and also sort of um, be able to um, utilize the you know randomization or the sort of nice features of randomization. Well, talk about like a uh, raw methods first. So the raw methods actually is to control for actual treatment received and look at the um, say regression coefficients for the assignments. Right. Uh, the problem with this method is that actual treatment received actually is post-randomized, it's not a confounder. So it's actually an intermediate variable. So you don't want to control for an intermediate variable um, because it's going to do something uh, funny. Uh, so um, I think in most cases, actually controlling for the intermediate variable will actually greatly, uh, it, it will, will actually um, make your um, self so treatment effects very close to zero or even like in the opposite direction. So it's generally not a um, you know good way. Uh, but we are but we are also going to talk about like how to deal with intermediate variables a little bit more in the second part of this course. So just want to put it out, you know, uh, the actual treatment receipt is not a confounder. Um, so you don't want to just put it is, um, you know, uh, in a regression model in the usual way. So this is a possible but not optimal method is to basically look at treatment um, received uh, and use what we uh, talk about in the last short course uh, on confounding controls, assuming that um, all the confounders between actual treatment received and the outcomes are observed, and then you say use propensity score. Um, or regression adjustment, right? So you can do this, but this is not optimal because this completely loses the advantage of a randomized study. So, um, and also a measure confounding can be a problem. So um, people who um, take the treatments may depend on demographics that you observe, but they may also depend on personal preference and other factors that you do not observe. So, uh, uh, and one advantage of randomization is that you can, um, you know, you don't have to deal with unmeasured confounding because of randomization. So, so I guess then people think about, well, is there a middle ground that you can actually estimate, you know, the um, cost effect of treatment received, but take advantage of the randomization structure. So I think that's sort of the valid question to ask. So let's take a look at that example. This is a paper from JAMA. Um, it's a randomized uh, study of uh, insurance program. So uh, they have an insurance program uh, and um, randomly assigned to geographical areas. And then each geographical areas like have, have serve certain households, number of households. Um, the treatment consists of encouragement to enroll in health insurance program and also have funding to upgrade medical uh, facilities. Uh, so um, the assignment is randomized 
randomized to um, sort of geographical regions. And within each region, there would be some mailings and other sort of form of marketing so to encourage people to to join the health insurance, right? Um, but then people may or may not join. So this is, uh, so um, the investigators estimate the intention to treat and also something called compliant average cultural effects that we are going to talk about next. But uh, as I said, intention to treat is basically to look at the effectiveness um, uh, just on the um, um, uh, so, sort, of, sort of difference in, in the outcome comparing the treatment assignments, right? And compliant average treatment effects as we're going to um, uh, this talk about in more detail is, uh, is a measure of the efficacy. So uh, it's a measure of um, the treatment effect of actually taking a treatment. Yeah, I just sort of summarized what I've said here. Um, so the intention to treat effects, the total effect of assigning a cluster to a program regardless of the um, experimental protocol compliance and compliant average treatment effect is the um, program effects on compliers, the groups of individuals who would adhere to whatever treatment status that they are randomly assigned to. I have more on this later. I just want to show you some of their um, findings and numbers. Uh, so uh, they actually look at um, so combined group and so some like stratified groups, but you can actually, uh, but you have a control. This is sort of the um, forgot what is the outcome. Also, the fact of reduction of number of households suffering catastrophic um, health expenditures. I think this is probably percentage. So in the control group, uh, hmm, number of Anyway, I um so so this is basically just a control group average. This is the intention to treat the facts. Uh and you have the um um CAC, which is the compliant average treatment of facts. So if you compare the ITT and compliant average treatment effect, they have the same sign in general. And um we're going to see uh, that intention to treat effects actually attenuated, as I said, uh, is sort of closer to the now. Um, and for other outcomes, you also see the same um, thing. You can see that the intention to treat effects, if the intention to treat effects is positive, um, the compliant average treatment effect is also positive, but it's a bigger number. And then if it's negative, um, ITT is negative, the compliant average treatment effect is also negative, but it's more negative. So uh, it's, uh, as this intuitive makes sense, but just want to sort of um, see what exactly is uh, this compliant average treatment effect uh, related to. Okay. So um, the compliant average treatment effects, as I just mentioned, is a treatment effect on the complier. The complier, but we need to first define compliers or having like a good conceptual framework to 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 work with. So and this um, framework is called principle stratification. Um, so. Well, but it, it's basically a um, like strata that is not defined by um, observed variables, but it's defined by counterfactuals. So, uh, so this is something that's maybe slightly less um, intuitive to some of you. So I'm going to go through um, some of the reconstruction. So the actual treatment received is a post-randomized 
uh, variable. So the randomization is on the treatment assignment, right? So theoretically or conceptually, we can actually define potential treatment received for each individuals. Okay. So um, for each individual, we can define a Z0 and Z1, which are the potential treatment received if um, the person is assigned control and potential treatment received if the person is assigned treatment. Okay. And compliance then can be expressed as a function of the two um, potential treatment received. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit more. Say, for example, if if I'm given control, then I would actually take um, take the control um, intervention. Uh, well, the basically the control, and then if I'm given the intervention, I'm going to take the intervention. So if this z zero is zero, which means that if you are assigned to control, you're going to take control. And if you are assigned treatment, you're going to take treatment. Then we call this person a complier because they take the same, well, basically follow the same assignments. But there are people who are assigned treatment still take the control, right? So they may have a zero as the value of this um, variable. So, so that's why there are sort of, you know, different types of people that's uh, using this cross classification of this two potential treatment received can characterize people into um, groups of compliers, people who always take the treatment, we call them always takers or never takers who are never taking treatment regardless of assignments. So this is uh, basically what we could do with um, sort of the two variables, Z0 and Z1. So we could have people who always get the treatment, no matter, um, you know, what's so, um, you know, treatment groups they are being assigned to, right? So we call these people always takers, right? So if they are assigned to control, they take the treatment. If they are assigned to treatment, they take the treatment. So they always take the treatment. And the complier, as I said, they take the same um, group as uh, what is being assigned to. And then we have to always take that. Conceptually, we can define what's called defier, who basically takes, always take the opposite but we usually assume there are no defiers in the population because if there's defiers, you cannot you cannot basically use the observed information to distinguish between compliance and defiers. Okay, so we present the principles straight in a table that we assume there are three kinds of people. Uh, some people are always takers, some people are compliant, some people are never takers. And we define the comply average uh, causal effects or comply average treatment effect as the um, so mean difference of the potential outcomes only among the compliance. Okay, so this is this is how we well define first of all define the complier groups. You know, some people are compliers, some people always take the treatment, some people always take the um, your control. And then within the compliance, we can estimate the average treatment effects. So, um, well, what are the pros and cons of this framework? There are certain advantage. For example, the straighter is defined by um, the potential treatment received instead of the actual treatment received, right? So, and the straighter definition is actually independent of uh, the assignments. I think this is the nicest thing about, you know, this is like you can actually make use of randomization and then um, to, to sort of, uh, be because the straighter um, 
the, the principle straighter, like whether you are compliant, whether you are always tickets, never tickets, actually independent of the treatment assignment. Uh, it handles a measure confounding in a certain way because this principle straight of membership dependence implicitly on a measure confounders. And it, uh, it requires no assumptions on treatment of uh, homogeneity. So, um, which uh, some other methods requires. Basically, that they need to require the um, um, always takers, compliance, never takers have the same treatment effect, those, those kinds of assumptions. But we, you actually don't have to assume that you're here. Um, but there are disadvantages because um, the principles straight the membership and observe also hypothetical. Um, you can you can't verify whether someone is a um, you know, complier or not. And also the number of compliers actually can be tiny or not practical meaningful. In some cases, uh, this is related to like uh, weak instruments uh, problem. Um, but um, but this could be a practical problem. Um, and results cannot be generalized to different samples because um, different samples may have different compliers subpopulation. So it is sort of hard to sort of generalize the results. So those are sort of uh, pros and cons of this approach. Um, but how can we then, after we um, sort of define compliant average treatment effect, how can we estimate it? So, um, so the way to estimate it uh, is to use a method called two stage least square. Uh, some of you might have know it know if you take some econometrics classes, but basically principal stratification is very closely related to instrumental variable methods, and um, well, which is which has has a large literature. So I'm not going into all the instrumental variable methods, but you can think the treatment assignment as the instrument of the treatment received. And the treatment received is what is called the endogenous variable. So things that are sort of correlated with the outcome in a known way because of the um, um, you know, unmeasured confounding. So you can actually fit this um, you know, in, into the instrumental variable framework, then um, then you can use this uh, two-stage least square method. Well, as the name of method suggests, it is it has two stages, uh, and then both stages are least square, which is basically running linear regression. So you have uh, first stage, you regress your treatment received on the treatment assigned, and then you can obtain prediction that's this uh, the conditional mean of the treatment received given a sign. And the second stage, you regress your outcome on the, um, on the prediction instead of the actual treatments received. So this is important. You know, you regress Y on the average, average from this first step instead of um, regressing Y on Z, which is uh, confounded. But by doing this uh, and because of uh, randomization, uh, one can show that the coefficient, regression coefficient in this second stage um, is actually an estimate of the compliant average treatment effect. So this is sort of how you estimate it and it sort of gets the numbers shown in, the, in that Java paper. So I'll take uh, a pause uh, and see if there's any questions. Okay, so if there's no question, let me share back uh, the screen. Okay, 
So, so what we have done is to define compliance, define the estimate of interest, which is different from intent to treat effects. And um, there's a method to estimate it, but I want to go a little bit deeper into what, I mean, I guess gives you a little bit more intuition of what it, this is actually doing. Okay. So um, this is a sort of um, toy example, but it sort of serves some purpose of explaining sort of the different concepts. Um, so suppose we have, um, well, as I said, like there are like compliers always take us never takers that could be defined for each individual, but you don't get to observe them. But suppose you can observe like here, like the brown, so like the first four, four percent represents compliers. The next four percent are always takers. Then you have uh, the green and never takers. Suppose we know the straight membership then we know their potential treatment received because this is basically determined by the um, membership, right? So if you are assigned control, the compliance will take the control. Always tickets will take the treatment, never tickets will take controls, right? So if you're assigned um, to the intervention, to the exposure, um, oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I use treatment, yeah. So, um, Compliance will take the treatment, always take a real take the treatment, never take us will not take treatment. So this is uh, um, the first sort of two columns determined by um, your straight of membership, right? And for the uh, compliers, you have a chance to observe the potential outcome Y0 and the potential outcome Y1, depending on whether the compliers are assigned to the treatment or controls. But for the always tickers, you always um, have the, you know, observe Y1, right? You never observe Y0. And like vice versa for um, never tickers, you always observe Y0 because they always take the um, you know, control and you never observe why, why one. So I hope this is clear. Like for never takers, they, uh, they always take the, you know, control. So they would only be able to reveal the uh, potential outcome for the controls, not the treatment. And for the always takers, the same. So, so for these two groups, it's actually not meaningful to define a treatment effect for them, right? Because you know you are not you you will never observe the the other side, so there's no chance you can actually estimate from the data without assumptions, without strong assumptions. So, um, so that's is a reason why we actually look at comply every treatment effect, even though it is a subgroup, uh, it is defined only at the subgroup, but this is the subgroup that you have the chance of observing either um, Y0 or Y1. So you can make comparisons only within this subgroup. Okay. So this is, uh, so this makes one point here, why we sort of look at this compliance treatment effect. Okay, but we also want to sort of look at um, yeah, this is basically what we just mentioned. So only within the compliant group, you can sort of uh, compare the potential outcome of taking treatment and taking controls. Now, this is what you actually have after randomization, because if you have randomization, so then the random assignment is independent of 
the uh, strata membership. So basically, each strata will have two assigned to um, you know, treatment and two assigned to controls. And then, uh, and then for the, but for the net, uh, these these four persons are always tickets, right? So even they assign to control, they will, um, sub take the treatment, right? And then these are never tickets, so they will always take the controls. Um, but then for the complier, if you assign um treatment among the compliers, then you are going to get y zero, and then if you're um give given Oh, sorry. So this is assigned to control, and then this is assigned to treatment. You are going to get one one, right? So, so this is basically what you observed. And this is, um, this is actually the data set that you have, right? Because, um, yeah, you you actually will have the treatment assigned, treatment received, and the outcome. So this is what the data set looks like. Um, from your end. Okay, so take a look at what intention to treat is doing. So intention to treat is actually um, comparing all the blue to all the uh, red. So the blues are assigned, um, the, the blue are assigned um, treatments, uh, reds are assigned controls. So the intention to treat compare the blue and the red, and they're comparable because the um, treatment assignment is, um, you know, random. But as I said, intention to treat does not take into account what the treatment received. There are some other um, possible analysis that you um, may see in the literature. So one is called S3 data analysis basically is to compare the uh, people who receive treatment to people who receive controls. They're not comparable because the blue people are a combination of compliers and always tickers, and the red people are compliers and never tickers. So they are, um, they're different groups. They're different subgroups of people. They're not comparable. And another type of analysis that people would do in practice is called purple analysis, which actually excludes people who take the opposite assignment. Um, so this is basically, you are comparing now the blue who, uh, and the red, but you still have the same problem here because the blue are combinations of compliance always tickers and then the red is a combination of compliance never tickers. So they are not, um, comparable in general, unless you have given some additional assumptions. So the intention to treat, well, but then we basically say that intention to treat, you know, it's comparable because you are comparing on the assigns, but how is intention to treat uh, related to um, the um, comply average treatment effect? So we actually, I mean, Again, this is hypothetical. If we know the straight of membership, then we actually can look at intention to treat among compliers, among always tickers and among never tickers. And then we can sort of average that. Well, I mean, in this case, I mean, you, you have to take a weighted average, but um, in general, but because these three groups have the same number of people, we can just take the average. Okay, so uh, I want you to look at both the net always tickers and never tickers here. 
So if you do an intention to treat analysis, comparing um, treatment assigned to treatment received among the always tickets, um, then you actually will get um, you know, the average, which is very close to zero because you're actually, they are all taking, um, they are all receiving treatments, but they are also uh, in the same group, right? So sort of the, um, I guess, key observation is here. If Here is that if you take intention to treat among always takers, um, you are going to get something close to zero. The same is that if you take intention to treat among never takers, it's also close to zero. But then if you take intention to treat among the compliance, among the compliance intention to treat is actually the same as um, the comply average treatment effects. So then intention to treat for the whole sample will be the complier average treatment effects. Um, in this case, this is like one third of the population. So this is one third times the um, um, compliant average treatment effects. And this explains why compliant average treatment effects is always a bigger number or like, um, like the other way is like the intention to choose always a small number because it's always a fraction multiplied by the um, uh, comply average treatment effects. And the fraction depends on how big the uh, compliance subgroup is. And why do this list square is doing exactly the same thing? I show you in um, this few slides is that, so this is the first stage, you regress treatment received on treatment assigned, and then you do the predicted exposure then for those who actually are assigned to one, you're going to get two third. And then for, but because it's basically just counting, you know, uh, um, you have like six people assigned to uh, one and then four of them actually gets the treatment. So it's two third. And then six people assigned to um, controls, like two of them gets the treatment because of their always takers, then it is one third. So the predicted is basically one third and two third. And the second stage is basically using this predicted exposure instead of the observed exposure in the regression. And in this case, um, the slope of y given um, the predicted mean um, treatment received is basically change in average y for one unit change in this, but you also can solve the scale change in three times y given like one per unit change in this, but one per unit change corresponds to one unit change in t because of here. Like, you know, this actually correspond to this. Uh, I have one unit change in T is actually one third unit change in this expected exposure. So you can actually get um, the um, slope of this um, second stage in the two stage risk square is actually three times the intention to treat and not uh, treatment effect, which is the, um, Comply average treatment effects. So this is sort of an explanation why two stage mean square works in this case. Um, um, I don't know, like they're they're kind of like stuff, a few conceptual things that that play around here. Um, but I guess the take home message is basically that um, when there is treatment non-compliance intention to treat effect, which measures effectiveness and the compliance average treatment effect, which um, measures efficacy among those who actually uh, comply with treatments, there are different culture estimates, but they are estimating things in the same direction, but they're, but they're different, okay? So the ITT can be estimated by comparing just the observed assignment groups, regardless of what's treatments actually taken. 
Um, the compliant average treatment effect can be uh, uh, estimated by two stage least square where the first stage regress the treatment received on a science predicts the average treatment received, and then the second stage um, regress the outcome on the um, predicted treatment received, and the coefficients uh, is an estimate of the um, compliant average treatment effects. And compliant treatment effects allows a measure confounding between treatment received and the outcome, but is a subgroup average treatment effects where the subgroup membership is hypothetical and observed, but is dependent on the um, unmeasured confounding, which is one nice thing. Um, but, but again, like uh, the, the 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 other side to it is that it's actually an officer. Um These um, compliant average treatment effect estimates more away from zero than the ITT, but they are in the same direction. But in terms of hypothesis testing, the CAT actually does not have a gaining power relative to ITT. So this is actually because even though CAT estimates are more away from zero, but their uh, variance are also bigger. Uh, usually scaled uh, roughly the same way. So in terms of high uh, host testing, you actually usually get consistent, um, you know, p value, but you don't, but you don't get any gain, even though it's, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's it's more like the 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 so estimate is bigger, but the variance also bigger. So the effective effect size actually stays about the same. Um, but I think people kind of use this more to um, as an estimate of what um, really is the um, sort of magnitude of the treatment effect, you know, uh, for for people who comply. So so it's it's, it's really like um, people use it more for just uh, and uh, it far away of more meaningful estimate in some um, situations. But in terms of like, you know, hypothesis testing, they're actually giving you very similar answers. Okay. So I think this, uh, okay, I have a few minutes before the break, um, but this is what I want to cover for treatment um, non-compliance. Any questions? Oh, excuse me. I have a question. Yeah. How do you how do you determine who is a complier versus like a a never taker? Like, how do you tell the difference between? Uh, how do you assign who you know uh, the difference between an always taker, a never taker, and a complier? Yeah. So these are all kind of conceptually defined. Um, when there is, I mean, when there is um, your treatment compliance, you can sort of use this to conceptually define, but uh, I mean, you, you can't really tell who is, um, you know, complier, you know, in, in, in a data set. So, so, so I think what I do here is basically to say, if you know this, I mean, I just want to sort of, um, you know, make some illustration why things works in this way, but um, but basically you can't determine. But this is not too about, I guess, uh, is this a slightly more subtle question um, attached to it is you actually can try to, um, you actually can estimate, say if you have baseline covariates or like demographics and other things, you actually can estimate the distribution of the covariates among the compliers. And you can see, you can compare with the overall population and see how different the compliers, are, I mean, you know, are, you know, what kind of characteristics they have. Maybe they are more, Say more, more well educated, like you know, high socioeconomic status, for example. And th this is something you could do. Um, although few people are actually doing it in in real and not, uh, 
you know, you know I, I guess it, conceptually you can do that, uh, but I think few people know how to do it. But, uh, but there, there's a way you could actually uh, try to to look at the distribution. But you cannot you cannot pinpoint individuals, but you can you can have some summary of like what what are the characteristics of the compliance. But I think this, yeah, this is a good question because I think this is, um, yeah, I, I guess people, people always, I guess for some people, this is, um, this may be intuitive, but it makes sense, but um, for others, they actually um, don't really like the compliance average, in fact, because it's, you know, you, you can't really, well, well I guess, yeah, you, you can't identify individuals who are compliant or not. Yeah. Any other questions? So if we don't have any more questions, then um, let's take a 15 minutes break. Uh, we'll come back to uh, continue our different topics on um, mediation and um, intermediate variables. And after like the next hour, uh, there'll be discussion. So if you actually have um, projects related to um, yeah, either treatment non-compliance or mediation or like some complex culture structures, uh, you know, um, you're welcome to sort of stay and we can have some discussion. Okay, so we can have a 15 minutes break. So we'll be back here at 1016, Gary? Uh, yes. Okay, sounds good. The Zoom room will stay open, so you can feel free to stay on or um, just come back. Hey, welcome back everyone. So uh, this hour, uh, we're going to talk about um, mediation and also um, how to deal with um, uh, your intermediate variables. Okay, so, uh, well, it's just some, um, I guess brief introduction to mediation. This is sort of the um, sort of most simple um, sort of some mediation data structure where you have exposure of interest. Okay, here I didn't know SX. Sorry, I use different notations. Um, and then you have um, M, which is the mediator, and then the uh, Y, which is the outcome. Well, mediate. I mean, it still looks. I mean, it looks like the confounding relationship with one very important difference is that the um, arrow is pointing from the exposure to the mediators. Right? So if you remember confounders, um, you have arrows pointing from the confounders to the exposure and then from the confounder to the outcome. But for the mediators, you have uh, the arrows from the um, exposure to the mediator. Right, so uh, you can also have confounders, I'm not showing sure here. So you actually can have confounders that have arrows pointing to every nodes here. Um, but the, uh, I guess the um, main problem is to deal with the mediator. So I just want to simplify things a little bit. So uh, you can now uh, for mediation and also like uh, analysis with intermediate variables, you actually are more concerned with pathways because in this case, uh, you have exposure of interest, you have outcome of interest, you have different pathway to go from the exposure to outcome. For example, you have the direct pathway 
which goes, uh, which we call direct effects. So it's the part of exposure alcohol association does not go through the other variables, but then you have also this indirect pathway, which is the X to M, M to Y pathway. Um, uh, that's the exposure outcomes association actually goes through the mediator. So people want that you to know about um, the relationship or the so relative, um, you know, uh, magnitude of the say overall effect, whether it goes through the mediator by a lot or by uh, just a few very little amount. So this is sort of what mediation analysis would want often want to do. Um, so the, there is a classical methodology called the Baron Canis methodology, which is a very popular, particularly in social science. Um, so um, I guess the main idea is that one single a regression model fails to be able to conduct mediation analysis. So this is something like two stage list grade, you would actually need more than one regression model to capture sort of different pathways. Uh, but it is done differently from two stage list square we discussed before. Um, so Barron's case approach involves multiple regression models and you have uh, this outcome Y exposure intervention X at media M. So first of all, or you want to um, so show that exposure is related to outcome. Um, and well, I guess conceptually, people do not want to talk about indirect and direct effects if there's no relationship between X and Y. Uh, so if there's no overall relationship, then people don't really want to talk about indirect and uh, direct effects. Although there is a caveat because um, um, sometimes actually uh, the power detecting is more um, indirect effects actually is uh, can be bigger than the power detecting the overall effects. But this is another issue. It's more like a technical issue. Um, but um, a lot of times people only studied uh, mediation on a problem that people already have Establish association between the exposure and the outcome. Okay, so um, then the I guess the next two is actually are the um, more important steps for the Baron Kenny approach. So the first is this is like two stage least square. The first stage is like regress the intermediate variable on um, the. Uh, Oh, sorry, I think this is X. Yeah, uh, so this, there's a typo. This is not T, this is X. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the T are all X. Sorry for the typos. Um, so regress the um, mediator on the exposure. So this shows that the exposure is related to the mediator because uh, if there is no association between exposure and mediator, there will be no indirect effects. So the second step is actually showing this arrow, the arrow from X to M. So if there's no arrow from X to M, then there's no indirect effect. And then the third uh, well, step is to regress Y on both M and T. Uh, sorry, this is X. Uh, so outcome regress on both the ex uh, mediator and the exposure. The coefficient on uh, for the uh, mediator actually estimates the causal effect of M on Y. So this is the um, this arrow basically from M to Y. And we can quantify direct and the indirect effects in terms of uh, some of these uh, the coefficients that you get from the three regression models. So this is a um, formula and uh, like a decomposition of the effects. So remember, the first step is to establish overall effects. So the, uh, the overall effects uh, C, and then you have the effect from the exposure to the mediator we call it A. And then we have the effect from the mediator to the uh, outcome, we got B. 
and then we have C prime, which is the direct effect. We we call this C prime. So um, we actually have all models linear regression fitted using the same data. Then um, we can actually have this formula. So C is what you get from step one. A is what you get from step two. B is what you get from step three. Then you have this formula, which allows you to calculate the uh, direct effects, right? Or you can basically say that the uh, total effect C is decomposed into a direct effect C prime plus the indirect effect, which is A times B. So A times B is the indirect effects, which is a product. And then sometimes we use a test called a uh, solo test um, to test whether there is um, indirect effect C equals to zero. So basically test whether uh, a, an intermediate variable is a mediator. And you could use bootstrapping. Basically like uh, there, there has been quite a lot of literature particularly in psychology and um, you know, social science talks about. So what has, this is uh, for um, your products and then the normal approximation is not working very well for the products. So the uh, people um, would um, recommend bootstrap. Okay. And th this is a nice formula, as I said, um, which is a effect decomposition. You have a total effect decomposed into direct and indirect effects. But the indirect effect actually does not have a clear relationship with the regression coefficients if some of these assumptions not satisfied. So, so this methodology, although it's simple, is actually pretty restrictive. So that's why the field moved beyond Baron and Kenny a little bit uh, in the recent years. Um, but Baron and Kenny is simple, useful, when the mediator outcome of interest are both continuous follows linear models and does not have uh, treatment mediator interactions in the outcome model. Okay. So some conditions, but if you are willing to make those um, assumptions, then fine. But, uh, so as I said, like the field move uh, a bit beyond, well, actually quite, quite a bit. You know, beyond Baron Kenny, and there are two major ways to generalize Baron Kenny methods for arbitrary types of mediated outcomes. The first way actually focus on the composition of the average treatment effect or the total effects into uh, components, indirect direct effects, and estimate them via G formulas, related methods, but I'm not going to go through um, that in detail. Uh, I'm actually going to focus on the second way um, that people generalize um, um, you know, Baron Kenny, which focus on modeling the potential outcomes using module structural models and estimation we are waiting. So this will be the focus of uh, the rest of uh, maybe uh, 45 minutes. So an advantage of the second method is that generalization to longitudinal data and like a complicated settings uh, are simpler. So it's a set of rules, it's a set of ideas that if you um, follow them, you can actually be able to solve pretty complicated problems. So that's why I'm sort of going to go through the second. Well, I also work on the first one. I have methodology paper uh, actually related to the first ones, but they are a little bit hard, harder to um, apply to in in um, in apply settings. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, well, stretch uh, for us. You know, we a lot of us are interested uh, you know, in HIV AIDS research, so I use the HIV AIDS example. So hormonal contraceptives are widely used, but whether hormonal contraceptives affects a woman's risk of acquiring HIV has been widely debated for well, actually more than 20 years. Uh, so we want to sort of study hormonal contraceptives uh, as exposure and then uh, risk of HIV infection as the outcome. So we analyze data 
um, from over a thousand two hundred women with HIV infected male partners from seven African countries, and the data collect for each woman every three months, up to a year or uh, to two years. Um, so I guess there are some practical considerations in self studying the hormonal contraceptives uh, the effects because. Uh, there's a sustained effects of hormonal contraceptives used on HIV incidents up to six months. Uh, so our visits are actually uh, every three months. So the effects of hormonal contraceptives that actually last for two visits. Um, so we need to sort of be able to model that. Um, so the, the outcome actually depends on current and prior use. Hormonal contraceptives and also, um, it is sort of interfered by other birth control methods, uh, which is condom use, um, and um, also pregnancy status, they are all related to HIV incidents. So we actually want to, um, in some sense, um, yeah, uh, well, take account, take into account like condom use and birth control methods in the analysis. But you're going to see that condom use and birth control methods actually are intermediate variables because it changes with uh, people, whether people are taking hormonal contraceptives over time. So the conceptual model is something like this, which is a bit uh, complicated, precisely, <laughs> but uh, so you can see it, but basically you have HIV infection endpoint uh, measured every three months. Right, and then you have the um, exposure of interest, hormonal contraceptive use. Um, you know, over time, like every three months, and then you also have um, your know, condom use, pregnancy, your know, indicators every three months. Uh, well, we want to sort of look at the um, effect of hormonal contraceptives to. Um, infection, but as I said, like, um, say at a visit, you are sort of measuring its use in the past three months, but then YT actually depends on past six months. So you actually have this arrows from the um, prior hormonal contraceptive use to um, the HIV infection, right? Because this is sort of like the drug defects last for um, six months. And also, of course, you have the uh, uh, most recent one that's related. Uh, but then also, uh, condom use, uh, pregnancy related to outcome, but then they're also related to the prior, uh, like, uh, you know, hormonal contraceptive use. So you have this pretty complicated um, back. Um, uh, although there are already some kind of simplification that we make here, but this is still like pretty complicated. So how can we sort of handle this? Okay. So, um, but first of all, we want to define our questions. So what questions can be answered? Um, well, at least there are two types of questions. So first is like, what is the effect of sustained use of hormonal contraceptives on HIV incidence? Um, or what is the direct effect of sustained use of hormonal contraceptives on HIV incidence without going through condom use and pregnancy pathway? So they're different because this, the second one is more like a like direct effects because it doesn't involve the pathway that goes through um, condom use and pregnancy, but um, the first one is a total effect which includes the pathway going through both condom use and pregnancies. So um, I guess it's again like these are two different questions. As you see, you're going to get different answers, uh, but uh, each question is probably, you know, would have interest in, in you know in, in different settings. Well the main message that we want to 
I guess that the different estimates, so these two are different estimates, require slightly different implementation of the methods. So the idea, are, I guess the general concept similar, but because um, the estimates are different, so we actually have to be tailor the methods a little bit uh, differently. So I'm going to go through both cases. So let's study a slightly simplified problem. Uh, to make things uh, easier. Uh, well, this is this is um, this is simply a but it's already you know uh, ha have so ha you contain the essence of the, of the complications. So first uh, of all, like you have two time points and then you have two exposures, a zero, a one are the two exposures or, or treatments. And then you have a y that is uh, measured after the second uh, the second time point, but you have baseline covariates that affect the um, so treatments and baseline affects y affects um, you know your your treatment at the second time point and also affects the covariate value at uh, the second time point. Well, this is, uh, and you have a time varying covariance. So it's basically like um, a time varying covariate here actually are confounders and mediator in a way, because if you look at the effect of A0 to Y, L1 actually is a mediator because A1 goes to a L1 goes to Y. So L is an intermediate variable. But if you look at the, if, so if you look at the, the effect of A0 to Y, then L1 is a mediator. But if you look at A1 to Y, L1 is a confounder. So this is sometimes called a confounder mediator or like a um, confounder feedback loop or basically like there are a few names attached to this. This creates a problem. Well, the solution to this is that you need to separately model outcomes, which depends on the periods and the treatment mechanism at each time period and use weighting from uh, the treatment models to mimic some randomization schemes. Uh, well, this is a broad statement, so I'm going to sort of go through the detail of each of the small parts. Um, but the caveat is that there are many possible ways to implement this idea incorrectly. So uh, this is also like the biggest challenge and the sort of biggest, um, you know, problem with this method because you know, you are um, you're handling a fairly complicated situations, um, and there are many ways that you can sort of do uh, the outcome model. You can do the treatment model wrongly, and then you can maybe do the weighting wrongly, and uh, etc. So there are there there, there, are, there are many possible ways to do it incorrectly. So we have to be quite careful. So. Uh, want to first, um, I guess, uh, well, introduce a concept that's going to help us. I call it working counterfactuals um, because this is actually, uh, it is, it, well, yeah, it, it is counterfactual, but it helps you to think about your, uh, what you want to estimate and then what kind of adjustment you will need to make. So first of all, let's talk about the overall effects. The overall effects of A0 and A1 on Y includes three pathways. So one is the A0, L1, Y pathway, A0 to Y pathway, L, uh, A1 to Y pathway. Okay, so I uh, repeated this basically, just, just one of this. So uh, what I mean here is that like, you want to look at you know, pathway that A0 and A1 can go to Y. So you have a A0, L1, Y pathway. You have a A0, 
uh, to Y pathway, you have this pathway. Okay, so there is uh, one that is through uh, A0, A1 and Y, but if you can assign them, um, you, yeah, you, you, you can also, yeah, you uh, because your know, A is the exposure, you actually can also, uh, well, yeah, yeah, be able to deal with this pathway. But uh, I think that the more problem or, or, or the more, um, yeah, I guess, a uh, problematic one is actually inclusion of this pathway. Okay, so for the overall effects, we can, question of interest can be written in terms of um, expectation of counterfactuals Y A0, A1, right? Just think about what you want to estimate on the total effects, right? And, and, and then to construct your working um, counterfactuals. Because Y can depend on a lot of things. And some of the things actually you are not particularly care about. In this case, um, you actually want to estimate the total effect of A0 to A to Y. So you actually don't care. Uh, well, you actually want to um, basically combine the A0, L, one Y pathway to say zero to Y pathway. So you actually, uh, so L1, the value of L1 actually is not uh, something that you're interested in. And your um, the estimate that you're interested in is, would be something like if I take treatment in both time points versus if I don't take treatment in two time points. Or if I take treatment only in the first time point, but drop the treatment in the second time point versus I don't take any treatment. Or uh, this is the treatment effect of a late adopter. If I don't take treatment in the first time point, but I take it in the second time point, uh, what is the treatment effect? So, so if you want to look at overall effects, your questions will always can always be written in terms of these um, you know, quantities which is related to a counterfactual of Y of just the two um, treatments. So I call this um, working counterfactuals, even though Y depends on other things, other things is not of consideration here in the, in the estimates of interest. The direct effects If we want to look at the direct effects, excluding this pathway, then actually we need to fix or control um, L1 to a specific values and examples uh, of the estimate or the contrast of interest would be something like this. For example, if you are um, taking hormonal contraceptives, both um, you know, time points, minus not taking um, hormonal contraceptives at either time points, but with say condom use fix that, I mean, basically uh, using condom in both uh, time points. So, so I guess the um, message here is that if you want to exclude a certain pathway, um, you can condition or fix a value of the intermediate variable. So if you fix the value, then you're actually considering the direct effects, right? But because you're fixing the value of the intermediate variable, you actually need to you know, you know, um, define working counterfactuals that also includes the intermediate variables. So this is some difference between if you, uh, want to look at total effects, your working counterfactual does not need to uh, include L1, but if you actually need, want to uh, estimate the direct effect, you actually have to, this have to be fixed at the value, so your working counterfactuals need to include L. So that it includes both um, the treatment and also the time bearing. Um, or the um, intermediate variables. 
Okay, why do we need to first define counterfactuals? Uh, uh, working counterfactual is basically it define the estimates. It helps you think about what you want to, um, um, you know, report estimates in the mathematical terms. But also, it helps you to think about the strategy to estimate them. So, what we are going to talk about is actually, um, first of all, um, to think about this, we actually want to compare it. Uh, to some hypothetical randomization. Randomization actually will help you remove some errors, just like what I have uh, introduced in the um, your last short course or in the sort of earlier session this morning. So if you do randomization, you actually break some errors from the um, you know, covariance two that um, variable being randomized. Uh, and revating actually um, have the same effects. So what we want to do is then think about randomizing all variables appearing in the working counterfactuals and de determine what errors are being removed from the more complicated data. Then we think about weighting methods that remove the same errors in the hypothetical randomization. So this is sort of the sort of steps that we want to do. Um, so that's why we, first of all, like we need to um, define working counterfactual because how many variables appears in the working counterfactual determines how many variables that you have to randomize. Then, yeah, so, so in these two problems, if you're um, looking at total effects, then you only need to randomize A0 and A1. If you're looking at the direct effect, you have to consider randomization of A0, L1, and A1. Okay, so, uh, so having said that, then randomization here removes all arrows pointing to the uh, variable. Okay, so uh, we start with this working counterfactual. So Y A zero A one, um, because you only have two variables here, you want to consider a randomization of these two variables. Then you look at the original DAC, randomizing A zero actually removes um, one arrow, L zero to A zero. So let me go back to here. So this is the original deck. Only one arrow going to A0, right? So we randomize A0, we remove this arrow. So L0 to A0. If we randomize A1, then we, uh, like we remove three arrows. Basically, you you look at the arrow head pointing to a one. There are three arrow heads pointing to a one. You remove this arrow. You remove this arrow. Um, L zero to a one. You remove L one to a one. You remove um a zero to a one. So you remove three arrows when you uh randomize uh a one. This three basically. Uh, so this is for the working counterfactual that involves both A0 and A1. So if you are working with direct effect, that's your working counterfactual three variables, you need to consider one more randomization on L1. Okay. So you do the same thing for A0, A1 removes the arrow, but then you also need to do the one for L1. Like you have two arrows pointing to L1. So when you randomize also L1, you get, uh, you get rid of uh, L1, L0 to L1, and then you get rid of A0 to L1. But you only need to do this if you're looking down in this way. Have three variables. Okay. Weighting 
as I also mentioned, is also uh, um, can remove you know errors and this is a way to mimic randomization. Um, so this is something related to what I talked about last um, um, you know short cause is that if you do inverse probability weighting, you actually create pseudo population that balance the um, distribution of covariates that's related to that uh, treatment assignments and attain a similar effect as in randomization. So conceptually, then weighting also removes arrows from covariates to the respective treatments. So what we want to do is to reconstruct weights. First, it's like uh, there's a weight, and then after we do the weighting, we actually um, can remove the same arrows that we remove from randomization. Okay. This is the first example that um, we randomize A0 and A1, but not L, but not L1. Then we remove this, uh, which arrows? Remove these arrows, remove, remove these three arrows. Right. And then we want basically want waiting to do this. So how waiting to do this is basically if you include uh, well, basically weighting models uses the variables that you want to randomize as the outcome and then uses variables that uh, have um, arrows pointing to it as the independent variables, right? So if you include L, say if you use a0 as the outcome in the weighting model and then L0 as the covariate, then you remove this arrow. This is basically what we uh, say. And, and then you have to do like inverse uh, probability weights. So you have a model and predict this probability for each individual. And then you use this as weights. Then you remove the arrow from L0 to A0. Now for A1, you want to remove three arrows. So your weighting model actually have to depend. First of all, A1 is the variable of interest. So it is um, put in the as the dependent variable. And the independent variables, you have three of them, uh, three arrows want to remove, then you have three independent variables in, into the model. So A0, L0, and L1 will remove these three arrows. So final weight is the product of the weights for each variable in, in the working counterfactual. You know, this counter, working counterfactual has two variables, um, then the weights each variable you basically construct this, and then the final weight is the one that multiplies them together. And then if you use this weight W1, then it removes the arrows, removes so this four arrows, and then the resulting graphs will look as if you are randomizing A0 and A1. So you want to basically uh, attain this um, same graph. For direct effect estimation, as we discussed, um, estimation of direct effect requires working counterfactual of three variables, right? Then we also, well, Basically, we we need to have the same weights as before because we want uh we want to remove arrows pointing to a zero and a one. So these two are the same as in the previous counter uh you know uh working counterfactual. 
but you need to add one more because your working kind of factor has L1 in it and you want to remove um, arrows pointing to L1. Uh, two arrows pointing to L1. So that's why your model will have L1 given A0, remove this arrow given A, um, oh, okay, so this should be L0, this is a typo. Um, the the um, independent variable should be A0 and L0. Yeah, this should be L zeros. Then basically we uh, multiply the free weights because your working calendar factor has three variables. And then it will remove, um, after removing the arrows, it's going to have only these uh, few arrows left, which is actually the same as randomizing. Arrow, uh, sorry. So if I type all, uh, A0, L1, and A1. So I want to uh, pause here and see if um, there's any questions. This, this is, this could be slightly complicated. Okay, if not, then just um, um, go to the, I guess the next concept is, uh, well, I kind of talk about this called module structural model. So in theory, um, like the weighting schemes allow one to estimate the mean of the working counter spectrals for any level of, um, you know, A0, L1, A1. Right. So using the observations in each level, but your observed data might actually have like a very small number of observations in a certain level. Say uh, you might have very few people that uh, does not take the treatment in the uh, you know in the first visit, but then take the treatment in the second visit. So even though the Weighting scheme allow you to um, estimate them just from those um, individuals, but because they have very few of them, so the estimated um, average is unstable. So the module structure models actually reduces the number of parameters to be estimated and lead to improved estimation. Of course, this is some, there's no free lunch. There's always like if you do statistical modeling, you will want to use say fewer parameters to capture the main problem, but then uh, if you, but you might be uh, sort of missing something. So um, this is just a very general situation that you are going to face in any regression models, right? Um, but this is sort of the uh, idea is the same. You want to um, make a use less parameters to, uh, uh, but, but sort of answer the main scientific question of interest. For example, if we have um, both A0, A1 are binary, we could actually use a saturated model, uh, basically just including you have the intercept A0, A1, and the interaction of A0 and A1. So basically there are four parameters and then there are four different combinations of uh, A0 and A1, right? So this is this is saturated model, although we sort of write it in, in, in this regression form. But we can also propose a model with some reduction. For example, we, um, we have this um, uh, model, the second one that does not depends on the interaction. So this is uh, this is a reduction, but this assumes that the effect on each time point are different, but they are additive, right? So there's. Um, 
So regardless of your um, the level um, of a zero you take in 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 you know time zero, then sort of you know when you have take a one the streaming and the control, you basically have the same you know, difference. So so you could do this, or you can even furthermore um actually look. This this is a actually com very common model used by people in practice, is that you actually use the average um, exposure um, as the combined exposure. So this is sort of saying that um, um, you know the um, basically if you have both um, time point getting the controls, then you have zero as the average, and then you have both time points getting one, the average is one, and then if you only have one time point getting the treatment, then uh, you have like a 0.5. So this is another reduction, which actually gives you one, um, you know, uh, yeah, so, so, so less parameters to estimate. And Module structural model, like one of the nice things is that it also works with different length functions. You actually can have a logic model if your outcome is a binary outcome, just like what we have you know, in the uh, HIV infection example. So the module structural model here is basically just a, a, a way to um, Parameterize the potential outcomes because in like a lot of situations when you have um, working counterfactuals that have two or three um, you know variables, you actually have to do some reductions. Otherwise, you have too many parameters in your model. So putting everything together. From a conceptual model, first of all, think about DAG, think about like what are confounders, what could be um, your intermediate variables, define working counterfactuals and the corresponding um, the, uh, um, module structural model that you to implement. And then you can see that how randomization will remove the errors. Then consider treatment assignment models that remove the same errors and construct inverse probability weights. Then perform the weighted regression model corresponds to the module structural model that you proposed with uh, the inverse weights. So, so the, basically the weights are sort of calculated from this um, consideration. Then what you get from your regression output is actually the um, parameters uh, in the marginal structural model. So this is sort of a way to um, make valid inference, um, you know, in the presence of a, like a very complicated causal graphs. So go back to our hormonal contraceptives and HIV infection example. So we have, uh, well, first of all, um, we look at the total effect of hormonal contraceptive use on HIV infection. Um, the working counterfactual would be, uh, we have YT basically, because we have like multiple time points, but then uh, YT, would depends on the hormonal contraceptive use in the last three months measuring the current visits and like from the, uh, you know, basically like four to six months prior measured in the um, visits, uh, prior visits, okay? So it has like these two, um, you know, variables. And the marginal structural model that we consider actually have uh, uses the average exposure as a combined exposure. So that's why uh, in this case, we'll have uh, like a single um, parameter, a single OS ratio. Now we want to um, 
consider because we have counterfa uh, working counterfactuals with two variables. We want to consider randomization of these two variables. Uh, randomization of uh, HT, HT T minus one removes arrows from uh, hormonal controls that they used in two um, periods prior and then um, condom use and then pregnancy. So it removes three arrows. Uh, then we want to um, consider weighting models that includes these three variables that also removes the three arrows. Right. So, okay. So let's take a look. Okay, I don't have it here. Yep. So you want to randomize HC T minus one and also HC of T. So you want to remove everything that go um, points to HC T minus one. Uh, three arrows. This arrow come from HC T minus two. This arrow comes from uh, CD uh, condom use and also pregnancy. Uh, there's no arrow from here to here. It, this is this arrow is actually to a lot y t minus two to y t minus one. Okay, so so you basically have three um, variables that you can. Um, I mean, I actually put these two together, so you only have one arrow here, but it's actually two variables, right? And similarly for the um, subhormonal contraceptive use, at time t, you, when you randomize it, you get rid of this arrow, you get rid of this arrow. So this is your weighting model. That's why you have two weighting models. And then you have a marginal structural model um, because you have longitudinal data over time. So we actually use weighted GEE with this as the marginal model. And this, uh, uh, you um, compute sort of, uh, the product of one over these two sort of uh, probabilities as weights. Then the estimated odds ratio e to beta is actually 1.94, 95% um, confidence in the poll conference one. So um, it is not statistically significant, but the estimate itself is a bit um, high because um, we can interpret this as consistent use of hormonal contraceptives compared to no contraceptive use increased the odds of HIV infection by 94% which is pretty big number, although the confidence interval is still pretty wide. Um, so we would like to, uh, well, but then this is the total effect, right? So so it, we are not clear whether this increase is actually due to a change in condom use and pregnancy. So if we look at the direct effects, then it's more complicated because the working counterfactuals now involves four things. Uh, you have both um, hormonal contraceptives used, but you also have condom use and pregnancy because you want to actually um, fix your pregnancy at a certain level. And we consider this module structural model that has the average exposure as the combined exposure and then uh, condom use and also uh, pregnancy. Weighting model is more complicated because now we actually have to deal with things. Um, well, first of all, um, four things in the working counterfactuals. So you have to randomize four things, right? We can group these two into a single category, but still we have uh, like a more complicated weighting models. But nonetheless, we can still do, um, you know, you know, propose models and then um, do the weighting. Then um, using this module structural model, 
um, in the weighted GEE and with the weights. And the estimated odds ratios for the this modular structural model is actually 1.17. Uh, well, the uh, which is actually much reduced if you compare to the previous estimates, 1.94. So this is actually uh, the direct effects. We can conclude that direct effects of consistent use of hormonal contraceptives compared to no contraceptive use increase the odds of HIV infection only by 17%, which is much smaller than in the total effect. And this is actually um, you know, consistent with the uh, uh, a lot of um, the observation, those studies, and and some of the um, recent um, conclusions. So, um, basically, like if you look at the total effects, yes, I mean it 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 does have a uh, um, you know increase in infection, but it probably is uh, due to um, you know, change in risky behavior rather than actually like the drugs having the direct effects on, on the uh, HIV infection. Okay. So we can summarize uh, what we have gone through um, in this section. So intermediate variables create challenges in cost effect estimation, particularly when we assess the overall or direct effects of longitudinal treatments on outcomes as intermediate variables can be mediators on some pathway and confounders on others, which makes um, you know, usual uh, analysis of not um, generalizable to these settings. Um, but this is also uh, applicable in a lot of um, you know cohort studies, so this is a big um, problem. Um, so we sort of lay out a way to consider how to deal with this. So first of all, we should consider suitable working counterfactuals based on the estimate of interest and propose a corresponding module structural model. And we can cons then consider randomization on variables that removes arrows pointing towards the variables to be randomized. And consider a weighting model that removes the same arrows as in the uh, randomization and calculated the um, inverse probability weights as products of the components um, inverse probability weights. Then we run a weighted regression analysis using your favorite um, regression software to estimate the parameters in the um, module structural model. Um, well, this is a framework that works for complex graphical conceptual models with multiple intermediate variables, multiple time points. So it's actually something quite versatile can be applied to um, so a uh, lot of complicated situations. So that's all what I would like to cover um, in this section. And um, yeah, any questions or well, we will, if we would like to sort of discuss uh, some of your relevant um, Will you be able to share these slides? Uh, yes, yes, I can. I think it's uh um well yeah first first of all like like uh the uh the recording will be available and then also uh we'll we'll share the slides with the uh, registered participants. Hello. Hello. Hi, I have a question. Um, so it's, it seems like with this approach, you're using marginal structural models to calculate the direct effect 
and then kind of comparing that to the total effect and using that to make also potentially make a conclusion about is there some mediation happening? I'm curious um, if in terms of like assessing mediation, why why you're not also looking at um, the indirect effect or is it because of like the assumptions that you'd have to make to do that or are you just, is would you use this but also if you're interested in a specific mediator look at the mm -hmm. direct effect yeah it's, it's a very good question yes uh, so in the um Burrow and candy kind of um models we can actually have like a measure both the indirect and the direct so um there are i i guess as I said, like there, there are two ways to generalize this. This actually, we we go the other way that actually uh, doesn't allow you. Well, I, I guess this is like one of the shortcoming of module structure model is actually it it only it can gives you a direct effect. It cannot gives you a good measure of indirect effect, or you cannot get a good measure of effect decomposition. Uh, like clean form, like uh, like like in the um Baron and Candy. I mean, Baron and Candy actually fits into both uh effective composition and also module structure model. If you have like a module structure model that is like or uh, like linear and things like that, but um, but in general, um, I guess going to this way actually sacrifice a little bit because you actually can do control direct effect, but you don't have something called control indirect effect, so you cannot actually easily do that. But but you can, um, well, I, I guess there is one way you could try to see what is the indirect effect is, uh, but it's slightly less, uh, I guess, um, well, you, you, I think you could do it in a way because um, say in here, these are all like direct effect, but if you fix the, um, if you fix the two, you, you fix A0 and A1, and then you change just the um, uh, L1, it is a measure of indirect effect, but it just doesn't, um, I guess, add up to the total effect. So so that's why when, so uh, and, and this is also less easy to calculate from the module structural model. So I think that's probably one reason why um, less people are actually looking at it. But I think you can, you can still kind of look at measures like, you know, if you don't uh, say if you, uh, yeah, if you take consistently taking the um yeah if you consistently taking um the hormonal contraceptives so you can do something like one 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 compared to one zero one it is a it is a um measure of indirect uh, sorry a, a measure yeah it's a measure in the right but Okay, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. So in this way, actually, you can, I can, I guess you can add um, one, one minus you, I guess, yeah, I think you can argue that this estimate is a, but it's, you have to think about this a little bit more because I, I think it it captures some indirect effect. It is not the whole indirect effect. So so that's why people don't, I guess, look at that to I, I guess focus on that. Cool. Any other questions? Or do you want to? I have another <laughs> just another comment that I think. Um, I guess 
One thing that I think is interesting about this approach is it seems like um, with when people use other kind of like causal modeling approaches to model the indirect effect, it seems like they have to make this assumption that there's no uh, there's no mediator that's affected by the exposure, but also con like medi or sorry, confounder of the mediator oh, outcome see. relationship that's affected by the exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like you're kind of like actually intentionally modeling that and removing it. So you don't really have to make that assumption here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is, um, uh, yeah, again, like these uh, G formula type of things that I kind of briefly mentioned as, you know, uh, they, um, yeah, so, so this love, love the times require assumption of no treatment induced compounding. Yes. Actually, we have, we, we just have a recent paper. Um, well, it's a methodology paper uh, that talks about if you have uh, treatment induced compounding, if you make some additional, but, but you, st I, I guess you still have to make some additional assumption is of no, some kind of no treatment if the heterogeneity condition on like uh, the, some of the confounders that then you can still be able to estimate, do, do, do some decompositions. Yeah. But, but I agree, I mean, in general, it's a little bit harder for the first way, basically for the effect decomposition to to deal with um, treatment induced confounding. But then for module structural model, it's, you can actually, um, yeah, you can actually, because it's, it's, it's yeah, it, you, you can basically factor, factor that in because you can actually, um, do it every time point and 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 then um so so can, can consider you know it this way yeah yeah thanks that's really interesting thank you yeah you're welcome and thanks for yeah i think um well, thank thank you for attending. I, if um, yeah, if you would like to, I, if you have some additional things to discuss, yeah, I, I mean, I can stay a little bit. Otherwise, maybe I think we can stop the recording.